So here's a little bit more complicated example involving three transactions, T1, T2, and T3. And we have different data records stored in pages PA, PB, and PC. As you note here, we see two time points indicated where the page content is written back to disk. And this example should underpin the difference between information stored in memory, meaning in the database buffer, and the log buffer, as in contrast to the information stored on disk in the log file or the database file. So you see here the transaction one is first of all modifying a data record A1, which is stored in the PHPA, and in the end um, also issuing an abort. And we see here indicated by this R1 that this rollback was successful, so completed. We have another transaction here, transaction two, which is also modifying some content of page PA and uh, also of page PC, and in the end is successfully committing. So this transaction two is of course a winner transaction in our sense, and as we discussed earlier, even T1 can be considered a winner because it completed its processing. We see of course it's not really committed because we have performed an abort, but at least in terms of the rollback of this transaction, this was completed. Here we see in the end transaction three performing a write operation on a data record stored in page PB, and then the crash happened and obviously um, T3 is a clear case of a loser transaction. And what is important now to observe, in particular on the next slide, when we try to fill in some parts of the log information and the database contents on file or in the memory buffers, it is important that we have to adhere to the write headlock principle and the commit rule. And when does one and the other happen to be important? Well, the commit rule certainly kicks in when we do a commit here of transaction two, because then the commit rule says that every log information regarding this transaction has to be written back to disk. And as we know, we're organizing the uh, buffer, the log buffer, as a ring buffer. And we, of course, have to write sequentially into our persistent log file that we have to not only write down or write out these entries for transaction two, but also the older contents, so the older log entries, which are not yet written back or written to the disk. Also, we see here we have two times a flush. That means we are writing back contents to disk. And the write headlock principle says before you're doing a change on this persistent storage, you have to uh, keep a note on that. That means before we do a change on disk in the database content of page PA, we have to make sure that we write down the corresponding log entries to the persistent log file. So here we have now not only the log contents as in the, in the previous examples, but we see here we have the database buffer content, the database file content, and likewise the log buffer in memory and the log file on disk. And now we by filling in this, which we had or we still have as an exercise or an exam question, I would just want to sketch here a little bit what is important to note. It's important to look for the cases when you really go and modify contents on the disk, like here we have a flush, and this means that the, um, the changes made to this page PA are written to the database file. So here initially the write to this record A1 was only done in the database buffer. So we have A1 is updated to a certain value, which is not specified here. Here A2 is updated to a certain value. Um, so the database file is not affected by this change. But here eventually when we write back the contents, the content in the buffer is still the same. If you assume that this is still uh, maintained in the buffer, and here we have the, now also the so A2 as well. And here now we have this information also in our database file. Now the log buffer, of course, has to be updated according to the right ahead locking principle. So before we update the database buffer, we would update the log buffer. 
So that means here we have the log buffer corresponding with a log sequence number entry or with logs entry with a certain log sequence number, talking about transaction ones, updating page PA, wanted to make a change to record A1. And this is not yet in the log file. So it's still in the buffer. So the buffer will grow, of course, because we have also other instructions here, which need to have a corresponding log entry. At what point in time now is it important that we're writing the log information from the buffer to the log file? Well, um, here you see that we are modifying database contents on disk. So this means that at this point in time, we have to, according to the writer head log principle, write the buffer contents from the buffer, from the memory buffer, into the log file to make it persistent. So at this point in time, we have to go here and write our um, buffer content to the log file. This is like for the modifying operations in the flush. And before that, we have, if you look carefully, we have also here a commit of transaction two. And the commit tool says before we can commit, so we, we can promise a commit to a user or an application about a transaction, we have to write all corresponding log entries from this uh, regarding this transaction T2 to persistent storage. I mean, we have to also here update the log file. In this case now, regarding the, the log information written here in the previous steps before the commit, there would have been already written back to the log file from the buffer because of the commit rule. Now, in this case, it's a bit redundant because we have the commit rule kicking in for this commit. And also we have to write a headlock principle kicking in for this um, change to the, to the disk. And now we're wondering, is it always the same? No, it's not always the same because here we're talking about a specific change to a page. Here we're talking about a commit of a transaction, but in this case it's the same effect because since we have the linear or the sequential uh, log, so we give these log entry numbers in a monotonically increasing way, and we're writing sequentially, in this case here the same information, so the log entries from the previous steps have to be written for this part here, and eventually I would have also written for this right in case there was no commit but here in this case we have both yeah. so it's important to note in these examples when by the right headlock principle and the commit rule we have to make changes to the persistent database or to the persistent log file to be more precise when a change happens to the um, database file So to conclude the discussion on recovery or to the different um, ways to do recovery, I want to just briefly go over some variants of recovery because we already sketched briefly the differences between like the redo winner and the redo all, so the full history redo or this partial redo. And we said earlier that we have to do a redo all because of the setup of our database system, because we have logs on records and the logging is done on a per page basis. Now let's assume we forget all of these um, configurations and look now what kind of configurations we can think of and what kind of uh, consequences this has on the way we can do or have to do database recovery. So for the first one, the very simple one, let's assume we have physical, full physical before and after image. So there's no logical um, log entries for the undo and redo like A is A plus 10. Here we have physical, full physical before and after images. And additionally, we have logs on pages. That means there cannot be concurrent modifications by different transactions within a page. This of course is something that we did not want, but in any way, let's just assume we have this now. Let's further assume there is no rollback. And what does this mean now for our recovery? Well, for redo, it was very simple. We can just go and look at the redo information of the winner transactions and we apply these. And this is okay, or this is correct, because the last image wins, 
So the last um, uh, action done is described by the um, redo information, so the full physical images. We can just take them and this is like a consistent state or the correct state of our database. Because we are locking full pages, the loser transactions will be at the very end of our history. History meaning now these, uh, the sequences of read and write operations by different transactions. And this will be the, the change will be done right before the crash because there are loser transactions and these uh, actions happen in the end. And so we can just undo the actions done by the losers by applying the corresponding undo images inside the, the log entries. In this situation, in addition to the simple redo and undo, we don't need page log sequence numbers. And also we don't need compensation log records. But again, this is of course like a very simple setup, putting large logs on pages, no rollback allowed. So that means there cannot be any um, transaction saying abort inside our um, normal operation of a database system. And here we have, of course, these wasteful, full physical before and after images. So let's change a little bit the assumptions or the setup. And we consider physiological logging in case of the redo winner approach. So we don't have full physical images stored, but only like descriptions how changes were applied, for instance, using diff or some logical information. So this is, of course, more compact than the full physical images as before, but the redo is not idempotent. So if a crash happens after a redo or inside redo, we have to make sure somehow that the redo is not applied multiple times. Again, we don't have full physical images like before. Before it was no problem, but now, of course, we have the situation where we have to yeah, carefully check if this is really working out. And just like this, it won't work out. So we need page log sequence numbers in order to make redo idempotent, as we discussed some slides ago. So what about idempotence of undo? Since we still assume logs on pages, the page log sequence numbers are sufficient to ensure idempotence of the undo, for the reasons um, mentioned already on the previous slide, that these logs require, or like these logs, the logs on pages cause, that these um, the losers' actions are in the end of our history. Now we are allowing rollback, still being in the winner, a real winner approach. And why do we have now a problem? The problem now is that the rolling back of transactions and uh, um, causes that these losers, which are rolling back, if you want to call them all the losers, they are not necessarily always at the end of the log. So at the end of the history that we play in our database system, so the actions. So now what we need to have is compensation log records to ensure idempotence. So now you see whenever we allowing more things, like allowing more um, efficient ways to write log information or allowing rollback now on this slide, we have to add more mechanisms in order to guarantee the correct restart of our database system. So now we have already here the need for compensation log records. And now we make it even more complicated, more efficient also, because we allow more parallelism, we introduce locking on records and not on full pages. So what about redo winners? Does this work? No, it does not work. We discussed this uh, quite some time ago already. So that means we have to do a full redo, which is also called redo history. So the winners uh, and the losers will be checked if the actions have been executed. If not, this will be done. So here um, we cannot have, using locking on records, the selective strategy, which is also called redo winners. If you're interested in more details here, 
including pseudocode or proofs of the individual algorithms, please uh, have a look at these corresponding chapters in the book by Vicom and Fossen.